All right, here we are, First and Second Peter, a message for today's church from Peter the Apostle. This is uh, lesson number four in this series. This particular lesson titled, The Meaning of Grace uh, and Suffering. And if you're following along in your Bibles, you're at First Peter chapter three. We'll be picking up the, uh, the passage from there. So we're studying the various meanings that Peter the Apostle gives to the concept of grace in his first epistle. And we've kind of covered the territory you know, where Peter talks about grace. When he's talking about grace, he's referring to two things. One, God's work throughout the ages to save man's soul through Jesus Christ. And of course, the preaching of the gospel, the establishment of the church, God's grace you know, being uh, uh, exercised in that way. And then the other way he talks about it is the effect that this salvation has had on those who have been saved. So, so grace is what God has done and uh, grace is also the effect of what God has done on us, how it's changed us, what it's led us to. And that's, that's kind of the thread that we've been following here in this study. Um, in this um, epistle, um, uh, uh, Peter concentrates more on the effects of salvation because the Gospels have already described God's work through Christ to save man. He's, gonna, he's not repeating the Gospel here. My point is he's not re-preaching the Gospel. He, he understands, he knows that the people who are reading his letter, they already know the Gospel. So, so far um, in our study, our study, Peter says that the effect of grace the effect of grace on us is seen in several ways. For example, we have a greater sense of security now. You know, people are not afraid of death or not afraid of condemnation, not afraid of an angry God because of grace. Grace has brought us to this point where we feel secure. Uh, greatest, uh, grace has brought us to a point of sobriety. You know, we're not under the influence of sin. I think in that lesson we said we're not drunk with sin anymore. Uh, and because of that, that, that spiritual sobriety uh, brings with it uh, holy living and a respect for God and Christian love and uh, we're more spiritually minded as a people. And then we talked about grace also leading us and enabling us uh, to exercise submission. In other words, knowing our place in God's plan and not rebelling against it. So these are the effects of grace in our lives as we, are, as we become Christians and we, become to grow, we begin to grow as Christians. So in the following section, Peter's going to add a fourth effect of grace in one's life, and that's suffering. But first, he takes a pause and he looks at the idea of grace and its effect from yet another perspective. So I need to understand that so far he's been explaining how grace affects the individual, you know, sobriety, security, so on and so forth. So if one is on the outside, what do they see when they look at a person who has experienced grace? And Peter says, well, that person will see someone who is secure, someone who is sober, spiritually sober-minded, someone who you know, is in submission to God and so on and so forth. That's what they'll see. Now, in addition to this, Peter says that grace also affects these people, not only as individuals, but it affects them as a group. And that group, of course, we call it the church, because this group will interact with itself and with the government and with society and with other families in a much different way than groups who have not been touched by the grace of God. You know, the Masons, they're, they're not acting out of an experience of the grace of God, you know, or the UAW or the, the Boy Scouts of America. You know, they're not acting out of an experience of of, of having come into contact with the grace of God. But the church, that group, okay, that group has come in contact with the grace of God and that group is affected by it. So Peter explains that uh, the difference uh, you know, between all these groups in the next couple of verses. So let's go, this is where our lesson picks up this week. Let's go to verse eight, chapter three. He says, to sum up, all of you be harmonious and sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. So a couple of the things that he mentions about the group now. 
Harmonious, of course, same-minded, of one mind. There's no division, there's no conflict within the group. Brotherly means kind, brotherly kindness. Kind-hearted, another word for kind-hearted is compassionate, especially for those who are on the outside. Uh, humble in spirit, uh, not, not proud, not self-centered. So the idea is, I've talked to you how an individual is going to be you know, touched by grace, but when a group is touched by grace, these are some of the signs that you see. Harmony, sympathy, brotherly kindness, so on and so forth, humble in spirit. He goes on in verse nine. He says, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. So the true spirit of Christ, you know, turning the other cheek, seeking peace, rather than seeking always to win, Peter says the motivation for offering a blessing is that we are the only ones that have the, these blessings to look forward to. So we can offer them now. We, we, can, we can go through the difficulty necessary to be harmonious, to offer brotherly kindness, to forgive and so on. Why? Because we've got some blessings waiting for us, additional blessings waiting for us. As a group, goes on in verse 10, he says, the one who desires life to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears attend to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So this here is a quote from Psalm 34 and Peter uses it to remind his audience of two things. One, much of the behavior he mentions before is possible if one is able to control and use his tongue properly and avoid evil practice. Well, what is it that destroys harmony between a couple, between a group in a church? Well, the tongue, right? Gossip, evil words, lies, deceit, you know, harsh words. You know, the tongue is what is what destroys harmony, brotherly kindness, so on and so forth. So he encourages them to be careful of that. Evil speech leads to evil deeds, and evil deeds destroy peace and harmony. And this, of course, is not a mark of grace. And then the second thing, he says, God blesses the group who acts in harmony and sympathy, brotherly love, so on and so forth, but he punishes and works against those who speak evil and do evil. So, Peter says, this is how grace affects the group. This was a kind of an aside here. So he uses this last idea you know, of God blessing the good and punishing the evil to open up a fourth meaning regarding grace. That grace may mean suffering. So he's gone from the individual to talk about the group and how it should act and why it should act and so on and so forth, and now he goes back to talking about individuals. And he says, among other things, Grace may lead you, the individual, into a time of suffering. Okay? So in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus you know, he says that His disciples are blessed or happy if they suffer on His account or because they are pursuing what is right or good, right? Matthew chapter 5, 10 to 12. So Peter echoes this very idea now when he refers to the suffering experienced by those who have received grace. Now we know that in the first century, the Christians there were, were being persecuted. So grace, you know, it, it doesn't cause the suffering, but those who experience grace often experience suffering because of their faith. And Peter refers to this kind of suffering, this kind of persecution in these verses. At times, he says, grace does not mean, uh, excuse me, at times, he says, grace means, well, you have to suffer. And when you suffer persecution, he says that we should remember several things about this experience. And here is where he gets into the meat of the matter. So grace leads you into suffering as a Christian. And if you are led into suffering, here's how, here are things that you need to remember as a Christian who is suffering. Number one, whoops, sorry, there we go. Number one, don't be afraid. Verse 13, 14, he says, who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer, <clears throat> excuse me, for the sake of righteousness, you're blessed and do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. 
So grace leads you to suffering. Remember this, don't be afraid. The harm is not physical harm, but spiritual harm. The enemies of right can only kill the body, but cannot take away your life. So grace gives us the power of not being afraid of wrong and of those who oppose God. You know, people say, wow, what would happen? You know, uh, there's this show, one of these new shows, High Castle, The Man in the High Castle or something, and it, 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 it imagines if the United States had lost World War II and the Nazis had actually won that war and now the Nazis are in charge of the United States. You know, it, it's a TV thing. It imagines that. And people say, wow, would that it would be terrible? What would we do if, if that was the case? And what would you do? And in my case, I said, well, I, I'd be doing exactly what I'm doing now, except it would be a lot more difficult. That's what I'd be doing. You know, instead of being open here, an open meeting, teaching the Bible openly on, online, you know, openly, any public space to preach the gospel, the difference is, well, we'd probably have to do this underground, in secret. The message wouldn't change, the goal wouldn't change, this lesson would not change, nothing would change. It's just what we would need to be doing would change. I think this is the sense that Peter is talking about here. Uh, would you be afraid or would I be afraid if some, someone threw you in a dark cell and chained you to the, to the floor and told you that uh, you know, tomorrow morning you're going to be upstairs and get a severe beating? And so, of course I'd be afraid, are you kidding me? Who's not afraid of physical harm? But he's saying here, don't be afraid for the big thing. Don't be afraid for the big picture. Don't be afraid for your true life. Secondly, he says, don't be quiet when suffering. He says, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. Don't be quiet, he says. Grace gives us courage to withstand what is wrong using the gospel of Christ. And he qualifies that our response should be in humility and respect. You know, we as Christians, we don't throw bombs at abortion clinics. Is abortion wrong? I believe we believe that that is wrong. But as Christians, we don't bomb abortion clinics, we don't murder doctors, you know, we don't do that. That's not our way. We don't attack uh, people who have same-sex you know, tendencies. We, we don't attack homosexuals, we, we don't do that. We don't take arms against our government because we may not agree with the policy. You know, that's not us. Grace gives confidence to respond to ignorance and immorality with what? Well, with truth, with the power of the gospel, preached in love, preached in respect. It may have to be preached secretly, it may have to be distributed you know, discreetly so that you know, because of whatever. But we don't. We don't blow ourselves up for our faith. That's, we don't do that. So Peter mentions that our response should not only be in words, but also in deeds that reflect our words. This type of confidence, this type of witness, he says, will win the respect of your enemies and prove that their reasons for attacking in the first place were groundless. So don't be afraid, he says, when you're attacked, when you suffer. And don't be quiet. Thirdly, he says, don't suffer for a wrong reason. He says, for, if, for it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than uh, for doing what is wrong. You know, if a person suffers for wrongdoing or cowardice or rebellion, there's no glory in this. You know, those people that, that we mentioned this before, that picket the funerals of fallen soldiers, you know, and do despicable things, you know, all in the name of Christ. Do they glorify God? Well, of course not. 
Of course they don't. Even Christians who watch that, they kind of hit, smack their heads and say, oh, that's terrible. I hope, I hope the world doesn't think that we're like that. And yet that, <laughs> and yet that church of 32 people gets this humongous stage upon which to <laughs> promote their wacky ideas. He says, if a person does right and suffers for it, the experience may be unpleasant, but it's pleasing to God. In the next section, he explains why this is so. It's pleasing to God because it was this kind of suffering that Christ experienced which led to the salvation of your soul. So in verse 18, he says, for Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that He might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. In other words, suffering for right, it has positive effects. And he gives an example. Christ's suffering, even though it led to His death, provided positive effects for those who believe. Verse 19 and 20 continues. He says, in which also He went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who once were disobedient, when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through the water. So keep the idea in mind what he's talking about, right? He's talking about the suffering of Christ and some of the benefits that have come from it. So he says, his suffering caused death, but his death, meaning Jesus' death, his death provided him the opportunity to show himself to the unbelievers who had made other believers suffer on his account in the past. And he chooses Noah as a good example of one who suffered for righteousness, but now is justified as Jesus proclaims the gospel to the unbelieving spirits in hell. That's what the prison is. He doesn't go, he doesn't go in the spirit world to those who are in prison in hell. He doesn't go there to save them. He goes to show them that they were wrong and that Noah and other righteous men and women who suffered righteously were right all along. In other words, we, you and I, his audience that Peter is talking to, we, we go into all the world to preach the gospel, this world. But Jesus can and has He's gone everywhere, even into the spiritual dimension, and he mentions hell, the prison, to proclaim the gospel. This is one of the advantages that was made permissible by his death. He was able to go to other dimensions as the Savior to proclaim. He may have gone to other dimensions, but Peter only mentions this. So those who suffer for Christ, for Christ now can take courage because one day His return appearance will silence the modern day mockers and the doubters and confirm that we, uh, we were right to believe and suffer for Him. You get the idea, it's a comp complicated path. The idea is He dies, He's gone to the spirit world for those people who were in the past who were mockers to show them that they were wrong. And in the future, when we're resurrected, those who are mocking from that point on, they're also going to see that they were wrong in disbelieving and in mocking those who believe. Another positive benefit of Christ's suffering, verse 21 and 22, he says, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to Him. So His suffering also sets the stage for His resurrection, His ascension, and His exaltation to the throne of God, to the right hand of God, to the throne of grace. So if He would have refused the suffering, He could not have sat at the throne of God and offered us the grace of forgiveness received at baptism. The idea is, look, He had to suffer to give you what you have now. And maybe you have to suffer too to make possible some of the benefits that accrue to yourself and to others around you. Okay. So Peter uses this opportunity to show that their baptism was not a mere ceremony or a symbol, 
but it embodies the actual way that they receive this forgiveness from sin that was obtained through Christ's suffering. So let's not forget our main idea here, because the long passage, complex. The idea is that we should be prepared to suffer for Christ because this is pleasing to God and it produces spiritual benefits. And Jesus, he says, is an example of this. His suffering proved to all unbelievers, even those in the spiritual dimension, that they were wrong and that the believers were right. And His suffering purchased the forgiveness for our sins that is received by all of us through faith. And that faith expressed in the waters of baptism. So suffering you know, is never pleasant, but if we share in the sufferings of Christ, he says, we will also share in His glorious resurrection, His glorification, and His exaltation. All right, so when, remember what we're talking about, when suffering, when suffering, remember, one other one. When suffering, remember, <clears throat> don't be seduced. Because it's when you're suffering, it's when things are going badly, it's when you're in the valley. This is a time you know, where, when you are susceptible to being seduced. So let's read, he says, therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lust of man, but for the will of God. For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lusts, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In all this, they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation and they malign you, one more, but they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead, for the gospel has for this purpose been preached even to those who were dead, you know, making that reference in the past there, that though they are judged in the flesh as men, they may live in the spirit according to the will of God. So don't be seduced. When people have to suffer because of their faith, it is easy for them to quit and having nowhere else to go, I mean, after you quit Christianity, where do you go? Well, you, you just go back to your former life that you once knew. So Peter reminds them that grace has taken them out of the world and saved them from the judgment to come. So he says, don't be seduced. Both the promise of salvation for the faithful, all of the faithful, and the promise of condemnation for the unfaithful, both of these promises are equally true. So don't be seduced. Remember the first sin, right? I mean, the first disobedience. What did the devil say to her? Did he really say that? Did he really? Did he say that? You know, if you eat, you die? Really? Is that what he said? You know? Causing you to doubt one of the promises. If you obey, you live. If you disobey, you die. Those are both promises. So when, when, when suffering, don't be seduced. When suffering, don't give up. Verses seven to 11, he says, the end of all things is near, therefore be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies. So that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So suffering, obstacles to faith, the sinlessness and disbelief of others, all of these things are discouraging. But he says, don't give up. Don't give up in living like and acting like a Christian each day. So in this section he mentions several things that can be maintained despite suffering. So despite the suffering, he says, remain sober-minded. Don't get panicky. Don't get depressed. Don't get, don't get drunk with sin. 
Despite the suffering, remain fervent in prayer. Despite the suffering, remain loving and hospitable. A lot of people, you know, when they're suffering, they think it's an excuse to be grouchy. They think it's, it gives them a pass on being loving and kind because you know, I'm suffering. I don't have to make the effort to be kind. And yet he says, no, while you're suffering, you, <laughs> you still need to make that effort to be loving and kind. Why? Because of who you are, that's why. And despite the suffering, he says, remain helpful using your talents to serve one another and to build one another up. Hard times, persecution, these things do not have to destroy how we treat each other in the church, especially persecution that is caused by a person's faith. On the contrary, he says, suffering for Christ usually brings out these things in abundance and it helps the church to grow. You know, the, church, the church always grows dramatically under persecution. When we got good times and everything is fine, it's just human nature. We get lazy, we get complacent. You know. But when you, really, when you really have to suffer for your faith, it trims the tree, right? Trims back the bushes, gets rid of the dead wood. You know, the people not serious about their faith, they're, they're gone. What was it in one of the debates or something, there was the, the mention that yeah, we, ought to, we ought to take away the, uh, the tax break, you know, the tax exemption for churches. And I heard some people say, oh boy, if that happens, oh man, that's terrible. Oh. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, so what? What if the government decided, yeah, you don't get a tax exemption, so what? What does that change? Does that ch actually change anything? Well, no. You think every country in the world provides a tax exemption for Christians? They don't do that in Russia. They don't do that in China. They don't, you know, they don't do that. And yet those people are faithful. So you know, when things get rough, you know, sometimes that's the best thing in the world that could happen. To I remember when we were doing the construction of this building here and it was just, dirt and you know, remember those of you who were here, we had to bring the chairs, you remember, you guys, Bill, Bernie, you know, we had to drag the chairs in here, you know, uh, Ron, remember we had to, every Sunday, had to drag in hundreds of chairs and it was dirty and there was plastic everywhere and dust, you couldn't sit anywhere, it's just, and not for a weekend, I mean, it went on for weeks and weeks and weeks and yet attendance was steady and the offering was, you know, we had, to, we had to gut it out. We had to be inconvenienced for a couple of months, 18 months actually. <laughs> it was a long haul. But we didn't lose anybody. Some say it was probably one of the most exciting times that we had. Why? There was no doubt that we were making an effort for the Lord. So when suffering, you know, don't, don't stop being a Christian just because you're suffering. And then he says, when suffering, don't be surprised. He says, beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of His glory, you may rejoice with exultation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Make sure that none of you suffering as a murderer or thief or evildoer or tr troublesome meddler, but if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in His name. For, this, for it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God, and if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. So in the <clears throat> in, if the head of the church who was perfect and sinless was, was cursed and killed, why should we be surprised when his followers are persecuted? Why should we be surprised about that? Peter says that God permits our suffering for his own purposes <clears throat> and for our good. Suffering provides an opportunity to test or examine our faith and maturity to see what needs strengthening. I mean, 
Anybody, don't you test stuff? Every company I ever worked for always had some kind of quality control to make sure the product was okay. Well, the quality control department in the church is suffering. <laughs> That's the quality control. That's where God picks you up and puts you up against the light, examines your faith. What's needed here? What's weak? And so Peter says, don't be surprised like, oh, what's happening? Why is this happening to me? Why? Don't be surprised. It's part and parcel of the of Christianity is that you suffer for something. If you don't test, you don't know what needs to be fixed. He also says that suffering provides an opportunity to more fully reveal Christ to those who do not believe. We always mention our brother Jim McRae and, and the people, you know, his two plus year uh, war with cancer. And how many people are just amazed at his spirit and his family and the, the, the care that he's received and the support he's received from the church. What a witness! You know, I don't think he's, he's spelled out, well, at first you have to hear the gospel and believe the gospel and then repent. I don't think he's uttered those words, but there's nobody at the hospital or the, wherever he's gone for his cancer treatment that does not know that he is a faithful Christian and so is his wife. That, that's a witness. Suffering for Christ Peter says, is a privilege, and it's a proof of God's presence in your life. They do not persecute unbelievers for their unbelief. When was the last time the atheists were persecuted because they didn't believe? Anybody? Is there any hint of that anywhere? So Peter finishes this section with a reminder that he is talking about suffering for Christ, not suffering for sin. If you're an alcoholic and your liver is ruined and you're suffering because of that, well, you're suffering because you sinned. It's not the same thing. So suffering for Christ is a necessary part of a Christian life and we shouldn't be surprised when it happens. We should rejoice, we should glorify God for the privilege. At least we understand the purpose and the nature and the blessing of it. Pity those, he says, who do not know God's grace and have disobeyed the gospel Imagine what their suffering is like. Imagine the hopelessness of their suffering. Imagine you're sick, you do not believe, the doctor says, well, you don't have more than six months to a year or two to, to live. For the unbeliever, for the disbeliever, what's going through his mind is, is that it? That's my life? That's all I get, 42 years? I don't get to do this, I don't get to do that, I don't get to see this, I don't get to experience that, that's all, I'm done. So he says, imagine those people, the suffering that they go through. So in the end, the way to cope with suffering is to trust God completely for two reasons. One, He's faithful. He will fulfill His promises not to put too much on us and to res resurrect us in the end. That's the problem. The same God who said, let there be light, you know, and there was light, the same God said, I'll resurrect you. It's a promise. And two, He is righteous. No matter what, He always does what is right. No matter what. You know, I think of, I've said this before, I think of my dad, died when I was 15. I, I wasn't even a Christian then. And I think a lot of us you know, have had that experience, right? We've had parents that we, we became Christians long after the, either they were gone or they were way too old. You know what I'm saying? We didn't have a chance to even share the gospel with them. We didn't, we didn't have a chance. This is the promise that it brings me comfort. God is a righteous God. He will do the right thing. He's going to do the right thing by me. He's going to do the right thing by my wife. He's also going to do the right thing by Tony, my dad. He's going to do the right thing by Tony. He's going to do the right thing by Jane. He's going to do the right thing by Blanche, my grandmother. He's going to do the right thing by Joseph, my grandfather. You know what I'm saying? He's going to do the right thing by Luigi, my other grandfather. He's going to do the right thing. Don't worry about that. So let's finish up. Peter explains that grace also leads us to suffering at times. And when it does, we need to remember several things very quickly now. Put them all together. When suffering, remember, don't be afraid. God is our shield. And don't be quiet. The gospel, that's our voice. And don't suffer for wrong. Happy are those who suffer for Christ's sake. 
And don't be seduced. God will punish sinners. And don't give up. Stay busy in doing good. And don't be surprised. Suffering is a normal part of Christianity. And to these I add a seventh idea, me, but I think the spirit of this idea is in the Bible. Don't procrastinate. If you're suffering guilt and trouble because of your sins, then don't hesitate to, you know, to receive a clear conscience. Call on God to forgive you as, as soon as possible. Call on God uh, in the water of baptism if that's what you need, as soon as possible. If you've been afraid or quiet, seduced by the world, given up faithful Christian living because of sin or discouragement, make sure that you're restored as soon as possible. Don't put off those things. Don't procrastinate. Peter doesn't say this in his letter to the churches at that time, but if he were here today, I believe he would have added that seventh, uh, that seventh thing there. Don't procrastinate. All right, so that's our lesson for today in this particular series. We'll keep on going with 1 Peter next time. Thank you for your attention. I appreciate it.